This is polarized light microscopy in archaeology. And this should be lecture six, minerals. So we have gone through various properties of, of minerals um, that are seen in polarized light microscopes. Uh, now we're going to do this from the other way around and go through all of the minerals. Um, more or less in this order, and as this is the cheat sheet that's in the manual, and talk about the properties that distinguish them. So it's basically saying the same thing in many ways, only differently, and sort of get you accustomed to looking at, <clears throat> say, a book about the minerals in thin section and what all those funny numbers mean. So, of course, we have opaques, and then we go through isotropic, which is basically garnets when it comes to minerals, and the anisotropic minerals. We're going to start with first order and go to second, third order minerals, and then the high order minerals. Plus the carbonates, of course. So, it might be useful to have a Mitchell Levy interference color chart uh, at your elbow as you're watching this. Um, course taking into account that this is this is the actual inter interface you want right there and also the relief chart for when I'm talking about relief with the relationship between the refractive index and the glue that you're looking at which creates the relief so opaques starting at the top of the page opaques will be something you'll be identifying as opaques, um, pretty much as opaques, yes. So here is uh, any inclusions that are opaque. The distinction is that it's opaque. Um, it's uh, here you can see in this peroxine, um, there is this thing which is you can't see it through it now, you can't see it in cross polarized light or plain polarized light. It's just opaque. So that's an opaque. Uh, you need to see that opaques are there because there might be a big difference between one uh, type of pottery and another type of pottery by the vast number of opaques in one and not in the other. So always record opaques, but really for us, they're just opaques. So don't worry too much about that. Here is a thin section of a piece of pottery and here's an opaque in it. So you can see sometimes they sort of sneak into corners and you think, oh, what's that? I don't know what that is. But that, you see, there's opaque. That's an opaque. That might be an opaque. That looks opaque. So basically, if there's no light coming through it, there's a good chance that's an opaque. Uh, it helps to have a nice margin, though, to be sure it's not just a very, very, like, opaque piece of pottery. So then we come to actual isotropism. Light is propagated equally in all directions. And this is the garnet group. So here you can see in uh, plain polarized light, you can see through it, but in cross polarized light, you can't because the light is blocked. This is also true of glass, which we will talk a bit more about when we look at rocks and when we look at anthropogenic materials. So here's the garnets, the garnet groups, a whole group, very complicated, it's actually an entire group. Um, you're very rarely going to see garnet, and so when you see it, it's just a garnet. It doesn't matter which one it is. So it's a cubic system. That's what makes it uh, isometric. Uh, the refractive index, um, 1.714 to 1.887. Um, if you look at the uh, no birefringence, no cleavage. Uh, some twinning, its colors pink, yellow, or brown. See, it's quite brown here. There's no pleochroism. The relief, which you can see from uh, the fractive index, is very high. You can also see it in this photograph, of course. So the distinction of this mineral is it's very high relief, or quite high relief, and isotropic, or very weak birefringence. Sometimes it's like just very, very weak, but uh, typically it's uh, completely isotropic. So that is uh, a mineral you will find. If, if you're lucky. 
um, in these labs, but uh, in a longer career, you, you certainly will find the occasional uh, piece of isotropic high relief material, and it is it is probably garnet. So there you go. And here we have a nice cracked up bit of garnet. So you can see the high relief compared to the minerals around it. And here it is, isotropic. See, it looks like it's quartz around it. It's in, in quartz, so much higher relief than quartz. <clears throat> so the rest of the minerals we'll be looking at have biorefringence, which is, of course, the measure of double refraction and anisotropic materials, being the highest refractive index minus the lowest refractive index. And so we have all the low biorefringence minerals we'll go through first, uh, then the high biorefringence, and then the very high biorefringence. So starting at the bottom of uh, biorefringence would be the phosphates, uh, apatite and fluorapatite. And so you can see here, this is plain polarized light. You can see these round inclusions. And then in cross polarized light, it's almost isotropic, but not quite. You can see it's just got this uh, very dark first order gray. So it's down here somewhere, right on the margin. My cursor is right at the bottom of the screen if you're wondering what's happening. It's okay. you don't forget, this is actually the uh, degree of biorefringence. That's what the bottom is all about. Um, and you can see that this, uh, this phosphate is actually uh, in calcite. See, it's for, sorry, almost like f um, white light, but it's actually the very high biorefringent material. And so this is uh, from some sort of limestone or something with... Uh, bone in it so as i was showing you earlier you get in the bottom of seas you get animals dying and leaving their uh, phosphatic skeleton behind and this creates phosphatic inclusions so phosphates um calcium phosphate hexagonal system probably not gonna matter a great deal um the refractive index doesn't not a lot of variation there so that's why the birefringence is actually very low. And you can see 0 0.001, practically nothing at all. Uh, it's got a poor cleavage, which means you're never going to recognize it. Sometimes it has twinning, but again, you're probably not going to see that either. Um, it's generally colorless, maybe weakly pleochroic, pleochroic, low to moderate relief. Distinction is the high relief and very low birefringence. And, and also occurrence. Um, you can get phosphates in uh, in some other forms of igneous and metamorphic rocks, but where you're most likely to find it is from these um, sedimentary rocks, where you will be able to possibly even find fragments of uh, bone, and also it'll have this organic oozy look to it, um, and also uh, you'll probably find it associated with uh, with calcium carbonate, with uh, sort of fragments of limestone. Oh, look at this, just like this. So this is um, this is actually a piece of pottery, and you can see sort of oozy, nodulary, sort of gooey things, and occasional bones, and very low, very low birefringence. Um, really tells you. Oh, I think we have phosphate. Um, and like that. Gypsum, just throwing in here because it does occur, um, but it occurs as uh, a secondary mineral in archaeological pottery. In Iraq, you might find it filling a void in, in, a, in a piece of pottery. And so it's worth uh, knowing that it exists. Uh, you won't be seeing it in a thin section that we'll be showing you, but it's uh, calcium sulfate with, with water in it. And its uh, birefringence is like very low. So it's also like first order gray, quite dark gray. And it looks like, you know, if you saw a void in an Iraqi piece of pottery near where gypsum is being deposited, you will see something that may look like this and may actually look a bit like plagioclase or feldspar, but is in fact uh, post depositional. So you have to watch out for that. So quartz. So quartz, you will definitely be seeing a lot of quartz in thin section. 
So quartz is something you're going to be uh, very accustomed to seeing and you will need to be able to distinguish between it and other things that look a lot like it. So it's in the trigonal system. Um, refractive index gives it a birefringence of 0 0.09 and also quite low relief. Doesn't have any cleavage, doesn't have any twinning, doesn't have any color, doesn't have any pleochroism, which it can't because it has no color. And the synchro is ready distinguished by lack of all of these things. Uh, most of the other things it will have um, that look a bit like it will have all these things. So it's quite distinctive. But there are also other things. I mean, here we have uh, a quartz vein uh, going through what looks like a metamorphic rock. And here you can see um, the undulose extinction. You see it's extinct here, but not here, but this is the same grain. You will only see that in quartz. And also in here in plain polarized light, you can see these lines of bubbles, the fluid inclusions I was telling you about. So the complete lack of cleavages and all the other things that are properties, but fluid inclusions and things like the uh, undulose extinction tells you this is quartz. And here's a nice big undulose extinction going from one side to the other. And here are fluid inclusions at very high magnification. So uh, you can, of course, increase the magnification to inspect those lines of whatever that is, thinking, is that a crack? Is that a cleavage? Or are those lines of fluid inclusions? And when you increase the magnification and see it's a row of dots, you know it's actually fluid inclusions. And here you can see, again, fluid inclusions tracking across this quartz surrounded by all sorts of feldspars. So quartz is also very important sedimentary rocks um, and so it's often weathered into rounded lumps and sometimes very little rounded lumps or subangular lumps or subrounded lumps and uh, will be found in pottery a lot and in some pottery it's the only inclusion you find including the type of pottery that we call stone paste, uh, which is the medieval um, composite of quartz and glass. There's an inclusion of glass there and clay. So about eight parts of quartz, uh, 10 parts of, of glass, that's anthropogenic glass, and uh, 10 parts of um, so 80% 80, 80 of clay and 10% of glass to make the stone paste body. Um, and you will be looking at stone paste bodies uh, because in particular uh, there you can do fun things with them because you don't need to work out what all the minerals are, which is something will be coming up in later labs. But some of your first labs will be just doing a drawing uh, working out angularity and stuff like that, looking at stone paste. So you will be seeing this. So apart from the coarsely or macro crystalline uh, quartz, we have crypto crystalline quartz or micro crystalline quartz. Uh, in a way, if it's crypto crystalline quartz, light wouldn't pass through it. So this is actually micro crystalline quartz here. But here, because the light is blocked, right in the middle here, this is, this is probably crypto-crystalline quartz. So it's very finely grained. So this includes a number of uh, types of quartz, but the most common one we will be finding will be chert, uh, which is, uh, so all of this is quartz creating this felty intergrowth here in plain polarized light and here in cross polarized light. And this forms from things like sponges, which have silicious skeletons in them. And also radiolaria. Radiolaria are these things. These, these are, I could have done with a scale actually, but these are microscopic uh, life forms that have silicious skeletons. And these would have existed in the open sea and been deposited uh, uh, at the bottom of the sea. And these would be creating these chert beds and sometimes we find 
Radiolarian Church. So that's Church, which is so filled with Radiolaria fossils that it's called Radiolarian Church, like this. So here you can see, you can see here the Church doesn't look very churchy, but this is actually all Church with probably iron staining in it as well. And so sometimes you might find this stuff and it's and you wonder what on earth am I looking at and you only recognize it because there's a radial area in it and here is some other sort of fossil thing going on here so uh, here is actually some radial area in shirt from the upper uh, Tigris and here you can see the fossils in the shirt so if you didn't have the fossil you might have trouble identifying this See, and here's another fragment. So if you had an inclusion, say, which was like this bit, and you would think, I don't know what that is. What on earth is that? And for one thing, if you only had that one grain in the entire thin section, one thing you might want to do is actually don't worry about it because clearly it's just not meant to be identified. But what you really should do is try to find something a bit like it that you can identify. So if you see a fragment like this big, which doesn't have the radial area fossils in it, then you need to go around and find a bit that does have the radial area and fossils in it, and so you can identify it. So if you can't identify it at first, try and find something that looks like it, but you can identify it. It's the first thing you do whenever you're trying to identify things. And this is again a stone paste. This is the petrofabric or petrographically defined fabric for Kashan in Iran in the medieval period. And you can see it's entirely filled with chert. And this is actually the glaze on this side with, uh, with tin uh, opacification going on. So serpentine. So as you can see, we're, we're looking at the properties as we're going through the mineral system. We're not looking at, at it in uh, the uh, classification of minerals. We're looking at it just this, this looks a bit like that, and so we'll go through the system like that. So serpentine, we will see. Um, its refractive index also gives you a birefringence because it doesn't have much of a range, which is quite low. So first order gray, see here it is in cross polarized light, first order gray. Um, there'll be occasional twinning. There is cleavage but it's very difficult to see quite often because you don't see like big crystals. It tends to be a very fibrous growth. Um, it tends to be colorless to pale green, but in pottery, it will turn red and it's low relief. So this actually is a piece of, of serpentine in a piece of pottery, uh, this time from the upper Euphrates. And so this is uh, from the Taurus Mountains, and we'll be talking a bit more about that when we get to rocks, about where minerals come from. Um, but the, this serpentine here looks like a bright brown blob, and you're probably wondering, how do I identify that? Because its properties aren't like that exciting. This is in plain polarized light, of course. In cross polarized light, this would be very low by refringence. So what I would do if I saw that would be I need to find something like it that is identifying and so if I actually go back to this you'll see serpentine is actually a replacement mineral it replaces another mineral it replaces olivine actually and I'll be talking about that when we talk about rocks um, this and so this replacement creates this what looks like shear zones going across the mineral and so what you want to find is that sort of shear zone. And so when you find these red blobs that look like that, but with that going on, then you know this is serpentine. And see, there's some more lumps of it here. So that is serpentine. So then we come to the feldspars. We're now in the um, feldspar group. This is sanidine, which I'll just briefly show you here because you're very unlikely to ever identify it, even if you do get it. You get it in certain potassic and alkali feldspars um, as what we call phenocrysts. I think merry men want me to leave, but I shall carry on. Um, and they look like this. 
This is the, the simple twinning you get in Sanadine. But if you had a teeny fragment of this, you'd probably think it was something else. So try not to worry about it. Uh, orthoclase, the potassic and alkali Feldspar group, is something you're more likely to find. So it's uh, so you get potassium aluminosilicate, uh, monoclinic system, refractive index means it has a low birefringence. It has cleavages. So cleavages is one of the things that tells you that this is not quartz. Um, it will have some twinning, but not the sort of thing you will confuse with something else. It's uh, colorless at all times. Um, so it's an absence of the crazy twinning we get in the other ones. And it has a lower refractive index than, than quartz, but you're unlikely to be able to distinguish that in pottery. Uh, for that, you would need to have, say, a granite or something where you have a piece of granite uh, which has quartz and feldspar next to each other, and so you can actually see the difference. So what you're really going for here is things like the cleavage, which is difficult to say see in this photograph, but when you're looking at it, you want to go to higher magnification, really look at it properly. And of course, as I told you earlier, this will break up into blocks that enables you to say, hey, that looks like a feldspar. And of course, this is actually a stone paste with the occasional bit of feldspar in it. So here we have a, a nice piece of orthoclase feldspar, um, very clear um, cleavages going on here. So you can see a bit of twinning, but nothing hysterical. Um, it's starting to weather. It can break down into the mineral kaolin. In fact, that's where kaolin comes from. It's from feldspars breaking down. Um, and so this can actually turn entirely into kaolin and eventually have kaolin crystals growing in it. Um, but this is just the beginning. So you might confuse this with fluid inclusion. But again, if you go to higher magnification, they don't form straight lines or vaguely straight lines. It's just areas where it starts turning patchy and and unpleasant. See, this is probably what's going on up here. And this, this, this is cross-polarized light and plain polarized light. That thin section of a stone paste from Syria, where you can see the, the blocky feldspar with some cleavages going on here. See, the rest of this is quartz. Yes, I told them that. So, still in the potassic feldspars, we have microcline. And that is distinguished. Again, basically everything is the same here. Um, but what is distinct is this twinning. And this has the so-called tartan twinning. So, essentially, if you see any feldspar with tartan twinning, it's microcline. I think everyone would just go along with that, and that's fine. So you see this pattern in a feldspar, go with it. Here it is in plain polarized light. You can see it also slightly starting to get weathered here. Um, can't actually see any cleavages, but they're, they're there if in higher magnification, probably, certainly. And here you can see the tartan twinning. Very distinctive. Won't be able to miss that. Um, here's a close-up of it. And here it is in a piece of pottery from Belize. And here it is in a piece of pottery from Nishapur in Iran. This is actually stone paste, so the rest of this is quartz, except for this bit, which is probably also a feldspar. Now we come to plagioclase. So plagioclase has a sodic and calcic N member, so that solid solution series. Um, but they are all they all have these attributes. Again, first order gray birefringence, um, nice cleavages. You can just see them going on here parallel to the uh, to the twinning. But what is really distinctive is this lamellar twinning. The the the, the mineral that looks like a zebra will be uh, clearly plagioclase. So this actually brings up um, how orthoclase is identified when it doesn't have any twinning. Essentially, it has to be a tacit acknowledgement that any untwinned feldspar you're going to call orthoclase. Um, and in fact, it might be better just to call it untwinned feldspar. But uh, that would be something that you would want to write up, that you are saying all untwinned feldspar is, is considered to be orthoclase unless proven otherwise. 
So here is the plain polarized light of that version. Also, again, you can see it is slowly breaking down into KLN, and but the cleavages are, are a bit more visible here. Also, the zoning, very typical of plagioclase, here with some lamellar twinning as well. And here are some in some pottery. And you can see this is uh, from the Yemen, um, where we have a lot of plagioclase in the uh, in the pottery there. You can see it's slightly been turned around, so you can see the extinction within the twinning. And here's another uh, piece of plagioclase, this time with zoning um, from Mexico. Then there's perthite. Uh, perthite is actually a texture that includes the potassic feldspar, which is the host, which you can see in this case not, is not just a potassic feldspar, it's actually microcline, and plagioclase, and this is the sodic end member, only the sodic end member does this, uh, albite, it's called albite, um, plagioclase, and so that's what this is. And if you look carefully, you can see it has the lamellar twinning going on in here, very fine. So this is plagioclase, this is uh, microcline, but together you would call it perthite. Here's another one, you see. So you have one type of feldspar intergoing with another one. Plain polarized light, you can barely see anything going on at all. And here's another one. Again, you can see lamellar twinning here and tartan twinning here. So this is all intergrown. And here, this may actually be an antiperthite, which is the opposite, which is a plagioclase with a potassic feldspar in it, because there seems to be more, um, more of the lamellar twinning going on than the non-lamellar twinning. So perthite will be something you will see. I think we'll be looking at a Yemeni fabric, which you will find perthite in it. Uh, but you need to be careful you're not finding granophyr, which superficially looks very similar. But this is actually a potassic feldspar, again, as a host, but with quartz intergrown in it. And so this is a cross-polarized uh, view of it, but you can see this is very clear and this is less clear. And so that's one of the ways you can distinguish between them because uh, feldspars can weather, but quartz does not. And so, you know, this is slowly turning into kaolin, and it makes it easier to t distinguish between them. In this case, in other cases, it may be less easy. So, this this up here, what you might call granophyr, the intergrowth of quartz and, and feldspar, um, but it also has a subtype of micrographic texture, which is probably what we have going on here. And this uh, grano... Uh, graphic texture uh, is thought to look like cuneiform writing, I believe. doesn't look anything like cuneiform writing to any uh, student NMC, probably. But yeah, that's what they see, the wedge-shaped things going on here. Uh, so these are wedges of quartz within the feldspar. And so micrographic texture. So this is micrographic texture within a granophere. And a granophere is also a type of rock. It's uh, what we call hyperbyssal, which means it's sort of underground, but not very, very far. So, now we're actually getting into ferromagnesian minerals, orthoperoxenes. So you will see peroxenes. Peroxenes are very obvious because they are high relief and very distinct from quartz and feldspars and things like that you'll be seeing. So... Again, refractive index will give this a moderate to high relief. Um, the range will give a birefringence, which is not actually very high. So it's sort of around here. It can be yellow or gray. You can see this is in cross-polarized light. It's actually quite gray. Uh, color in plain polarized like light. It can be colorless or reddish or greenish, uh, depending on which end of the spectrum it is. Um, it will have some pleochroism for this magnesium-rich one. Um, but, of course, the most distinctive attribute of the orthoperoxenes is the straight extinction. So here you can see 
orthoperoxines uh, with what looks like feldspars, and here it's extinct parallel to the crosshairs. So here's the crosshairs, and if it was a clinoperoxine, it'd be going extinct at some other angle like this. But that makes clear clear that this high relief mineral. Go back to the plane polarized look view. You see very high relief mineral compared to the feldspars around it. Um, quite low biorefringence and parallel extinction. So the olivine group. So olivine is a very important mineral. We don't get to see a lot of it. In fact, I think the only time I typically see it is actually as an inclusion in an inclusion of basalt. See, this is actually an olivine basalt. So that's typically when I tend to see it more often, say, in in uh, the Tigris Euphrates Basin or somewhere like that, where you get, uh, or in Zabid also in, in Yemen, where you have fragments of basalt with olivine within it. So it has uh, not particularly obvious uh, cleavage, the sort of thing that we would probably hardly even see in pottery. Um, tends to be uh, colorless to uh, pale yellow. Uh, the it has a bit of pleochroism, and uh, the the relief can be moderate to very, very high. So you can distinguish it from the clinoperoxines by its higher birefringence. Uh, it's really not very good cleavage, and from epidote by the oblique extinction of of epidote, which means it extinguish at an angle or being orthrhombic of course it has parallel extinction just like the orthoperoxines. Um, this is probably not going to be that difficult because epidote has that horrible yellow color which we shall come to a bit later on. Oh not so later on after all. Um, so here is epidote and as I was telling you hang on oh no it's gone never mind it has this horrible yellowish pleochroism colors to greenish yellow, sort of sickly, sickly yellow. You can see there's bits of it here and bits of it gone a, a darker yellow. And so it ranges from this yellow to this yellow within within the uh, inclusion. So here it's uh, entirely there. Um, right. From hornblende and clinoperoxins by its single cleavage, higher birefringence than characteristic pleochroism. But when you have teeny weeny little bits flying, floating around in pottery, what you'll mostly be seeing is uh, that relief, high to very high relief, and that horrible yellow pleochroism. And we do get this in the Tigris Euphrates Basin. And tourmaline, which again, you'll be very lucky to find. Um, is, isn't that an amazing chemical formula? And basically, you can have almost anything in it as an aluminosilicates go. But the most important thing is, of course, the boron. There it is, B. Um, it's a very distinctive element in tourmaline. Uh, the refractive index um, gives it uh, quite high birefringence. The cleavages typically are poor. They don't look bad here, but you know. Oh, sorry, it's gone too far. I wanted to do that. But what is really distinctive about it, of course, is the pleochroism and uh, and like that. So the marked pleochroism, um, even dichroism, where it actually goes through more than one color, more than two colors, I should say. Um, really makes this a very distinct mineral when you actually get to see it, which you may you may get to see it when we're looking at pottery from Godin Tepe in the Zagros Mountains of Iran. So then we come to the clinoperoxines. So you had the orthoperoxines and now it's the clinoperoxines which are separate because they are higher by refringence. Because now we're we're way up here somewhere you see. If you're looking at the colourful thing at the bottom of the screen here. Way up here. So the orthoproxines will be down here somewhere, and the clinoproxines will be up here somewhere. So that's a major distinction between them, even though they both have the same uh, cleavage. 
Um, I keep saying it's 97, 90 degrees, but it's probably actually 87 degrees, like this says. Too good at 87 degrees. <coughs> so this one is actually diopside Hedenbergite. So that's around here. You might remember this from earlier lectures. You have the magnesium end member, the ferric end member for the orthoperoxenes down here. And the clinoperoxenes here are in the middle uh, with more calcium in it. So this has that quite simil simple form formula, diopside Edenbergite, going from one to the other. Uh, augite, which we'll be looking at next, which is actually a far more common mineral, um, I believe, uh, is, is kind of crazy complicated. And here is wollastonite, which I only recognize in thin section because it grows in glazes sometimes. So that's the calcium end member. So here is uh, augite or ferro-augite variant with, of course, calcium, magnesium and, and iron. But also you get other stuff in it, too. So it's, it's a bit of a, a sponge. And so the refractive index range here gives it quite a lot of birefringence. And so that, that colorful high-release thing in your thin section is very probably uh, augite. Um, but the, the best thing is to call it a clinoperoxene uh, because there are a number of peroxines and one of the ways we typically identify it is by looking at what it's in. This is in a volcanic rock, this one, and you can actually see the properties of a volcanic rock that are glassy. This is a glassy volcanic rock because it's actually isotropic for volcanic glass. And so it has these crystals, these phenocrysts, as we call them, of augite, um, which is the kind of uh, peroxine you get in most uh, volcanic rocks. But when you have just a lump of this floating around in a piece of pottery, then you're going to not necessarily assume it's an augite, but just call it a clinoperoxine. And that's what it's called on your form. And of course, the two degrees at 90 degrees, two cleavages at 90 degrees, uh, actually 88, but I never remember that. I just think it's 90 degrees. And uh, like that. This one is actually quite low relief. So not no relief. It's always high relief, but it can be low by refringence just because it wants to be. You see. And here, this is a very nice proxy. It's very common in the uh, the basic volcanic rocks. This is probably a gabbro, but also basalt, which we get a lot of. And so you'll be getting that weathered down. And here is actually a gabbro. You can see this one's actually slightly pleochroic. And here we have it <clears throat> in a piece of pottery. This one's actually from the Yemen, and you can see the uh, the high birefringence bit of uh, twinning going on here. Um, this is actually the slip and the glaze, and this is the rest of the universe, and this is the pottery. So often you'll find this again a Yemeni fabric that you'll find fragments of basalt, which is probably the source of the proxene. And here's another one. Here you can see the, the cleavages and also the twinning. Quite often you're just going to see little bits like this. You might have noticed that in the Jerusalem petrofabric, of course, where you just get teeny little bits of things that don't seem to belong. So then we come to the amphiboles. Now, these are, again, a mineral you should probably just remember by their group name of amphiboles. I will show you some diversity. But hornblende is the most common one. It's the one you're most likely to find. Um, it has uh, distinctively green pleochroism. Unfortunately, or, or unfortunately, but it happens. In uh, the firing, this will m is most likely going to turn red. So it'll actually be green, uh, red pleochroism rather than green, but it was probably a hornblende in the first place. So this happens in the firing process when these become oxidized. 
you can see it's nice and green at the moment. So distinctive properties of this um, include the cleavage, has two good, good cleavages, and of course I'm always saying 120 degrees, it's actually 56 degrees. I don't know who decided which one was the right measurement, um, but you know, it's about 120 degrees or about 60 degrees, depending on which way you're at it. And that pleochroism, moderate to strong pleochroism. So here we have that pleochroism in this nice fragment of horn blend in a uh, volcanic rock. Here we have one in an igneous uh, intrusive rock. And you can see clearly those two cleavages that will help you distinguish all of the amphibole group from any other mineral. Um, that's something you always need to be look, looking out for. In this case, it's probably that this is the pleochrosing from this to, to, to this. But it's uh, that cleavage that will tell you it's, a, it's a, an amphibole even if you don't have a horn blend. And here we have a piece of pottery, again from the Yemen. And you can see that's actually been rotated around here. This is the same inclusion. And you can see the two cleavages, 120 degrees. And you can see the, the pleochroism. But you also get other amphiboles, which you should not worry too much about. But basically, that's why you call them amphiboles. This is tremolite actinolite. Um, again, not an uncommon rock forming mineral. Um, but what you'll be doing is saying this is an amphibole and it has these other attributes. Um, for instance, uh, this may be colorless. Uh, I think actinolite is the, uh, the iron depleted variant, which is uh, actually colorless. And so it has no pleochroism. And so you're going to find something white, high relief, two cleavages at 120 degrees. And you will not say, what on earth is that? You're going to say, oh, look, it has two cleavages at 100 degrees and it's high relief. So therefore, it's an amphibole. Um, but you will say, however, this one seems to lack any pleochroism. So it's probably in the tremolite to actinolite series. But uh, you shouldn't worry about it too much. Or it might be, even be blue. I've never actually seen this in, in a pottery thin section. But it shows you, I'm not giving you all the numbers for this one, just showing you how hysterical these can be. But it'll still be high relief. And if you get the right orientation, you will see it has two cleavages at 120 degrees, like this, you see. So again, it's going to be quite distinctive. Here is yet another type of amphibole, which you don't need to remember. Coming to light, grunerite, again, it's a, a series of magnesium to iron rich end members. And again, uh, high birefringence. Uh, this is a metamorphic rock. You can see because it has uh, quartz and uh, coming to that grunerite. And also this, which is isotropic. It looks like it's sort of equant. So this is probably a garnet, high relief, you see. So this is garnet and quartz here and coming to that grunerite. So this is a metamorphic rock. This was once probably some sort of shaly, uh, silty rock with quartz and clay minerals, which was highly metamorphosed into this. You see here, that's a bit of this, and you're looking down the C-axis. So you can see the two cleavages at 120 degrees. Is that fun? So that brings us to the mica group, also very major rock forming minerals. And so there are a couple of other ones which we shall not worry about because we mostly just see muscovite and biotite. And really there are a number of attributes for all the mica group. And the colorless one is muscovite and the brown one is biotite. Um, so any colorless mica may be considered to be muscovite. Just call it muscovite, feel free. Um, but one thing about it is at higher firing temperatures, the muscovite will burn out. Uh, it can be destroyed just like uh, the clay minerals can be <clears throat> at a high enough temperature.
zone here is biotite. So this, of course, will have the pleochroism, quite a lot of it, actually. But one thing you'll find for all of the micas is the pronounced cleavage. You see all of this has this long cleavage, perfect cleavage, all the way along the, the crystals like this. And uh, it'll have that twinkly extinction I was telling you about. So and if we go, oh no, you can just see it in this. And of course, you want it to be higher magnification than that. But it's a bit more obvious in here. And here you can see it as well. This is in a granite, see with microcline in it. You often get biotite in granites. But here's that twinkly extinction in, uh, in uh, higher magnification. So you can see that when, when this is the whole biotite crystal here, it's actually extinct. Bits of it will be twinkling on still. Very distinctive of micas. And here we have uh, biotite. This can also get really messed up in the firing, um, and it, but it tends to not actually completely disappear. Muscovite can completely disappear, but biotite will turn into a black lump. Well, you might say, well, that's opaque, but no, it will still have attributes. And you will look at something that might be opaque and see that it actually is elongate. You see, this, this is actually not opaque it's this would be pleochroic if uh, we turn the stage but it's um see very colorful but uh you see how during the firing process it's starting to break up along that cleavage and so if you see something which is a long gate like this is which is what we would call a cleavage fragment and you can see the cleavages are highly developed but it's turning black because it's being destroyed in the firing then you probably are actually looking at biotite. And you may see lots of little plates of what may actually be biotite in the matrix. So this is one type of what may be opaque. You'll be wanting to say there are all these elongate opaque things and the pottery looks highly fired. So this may be biotite. And so you want to, because it's, it's very important if you have some other pottery from the same site, that uh, is lower fired and it has biotite, you don't want to get confused between the biotite and the opaques. <clears throat> and so that brings us to right at the top here. So we've gone right off the range. At the, I'm looking at the bottom of the screen again. Um, and we're off into the white light zone and we have calcite. So here is calcite. I don't know what's happening there. And so this is that plain polarized light um, and you see it's this is what this is showing is um, I don't know why the thing isn't first never mind um, this shows that distinctive feature I've showed you about before where the uh, relief changes when you rotate the stage so it's very distinctive so extremely birefringent see this is the full breakdown uh, it has a cleavage, uh, but it's it's the, the great range of refractive indices that makes it very highly birefringent. So we're, we're practically looking, looking at white light in places or very pastel soft shades of, of colors. Um, and another thing it will have will be um, that variable relief, which makes it distinct from all other minerals. Also, it's effervescent dilute HCl, but you can't see that in thin section, of course. That's why you'd be best to call all of the carbonates carbonate, then rather than actually try to identify them as calcite. Um, typically, what I will do is say, oh, this has X percent carbonate in it, which I think is this. Um, in this case, it's calcite. And of course, one source of it, this is probably marble, the metamorphic rock. But where it comes from originally is from the bodies, the skeletons of calcareous skeleton organisms. And so here you can see all this fossiliferous limestone, which is typical of a source of, of calcite in the earth. And we find it in pottery. You find it in pottery quite a lot. 
Um, this can also get fired out at very high temperatures, um, but typically we'll have what we call sparry calcite, um, which are crystals of calcite, which here you can see they are broken into, again, cleavage fragments. And you can see that the two very nice cleavages and it's, um, it's actually been broken up in order to be added to this pottery that's been tempered with, uh, with crushed calcite, um, which makes it, this, this is actually a, a cooking pot because calcite likes, uh, uh, cooking pots like calcite. We'll probably talk a bit about that later on. Um, and you have micritic carbonate, which is the fine grain stuff, which may actually be like a fragment of limestone. But uh, basically, just call it micritic and spiry calcite. And then you have dolomite, um, which again looks pretty much like calcite. If you have uh, little bits of it in a piece of pottery, it's better to call all of the uh, carbonate carbonate unless you have some evidence to say what it is. A certain line of evidence would be like you can stain it. You can actually stain calcite but you can't stain dolomite. Um, but we're, we don't do that for pottery thin sections because we do well enough without being able to precisely identify whether it's dolomite or calcite. Um, although occasionally if, <clears throat> if you would imagine this is a rock in which all the pink bits are being weathered out then you will have these distinctive rom shapes, which are the dolomite. And uh, I've actually seen pottery from Western Syria where that is so. So it's known that this is actually dolomite that is in the pottery. So that concludes our look through the minerals. Thank you.